Bye and bye. then we have a new player for the marathon. Oh. I hear that our next competitor, he poorly hydrated today. No time for beer or food. Eight hours continuing education. And all that we're going to have is energy to bring you in. So welcome, Rick. Thank you so much. I know the effort. Thank you. I yes. appreciate it. Yes, Dr. Roble. Yeah, you guys are awesome. I'm, I'm, I hope it's going well. I wish I could have participated more. Um, so we've had been, things going on too. So how's it gone? Pretty good? It's been going strong. It's been going How strong. many? How many we have already? We're on the stretch. We're at the bottom of stretch for the last four. No way. Oh my God. That's awesome. It's a seven inning last stretch, four. Doc. <laughs> Well, hopefully we won't let you down here in Arkansas. No, so, um, not at all. I don't think so. So you said I have uh, an hour and 45 minutes. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> For you, two hours. <laughs> oh, my God. No, I told you. He called me yesterday at five. I don't have a link. Why do I don't have a link? Oh, my God. <laughs> I was... Jesus. I, I, I had to leave my other... We did our... our um, Second series, part two here online, two day series on SFOT that we're doing. And the response is amazing. I just love it. So, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Do you, what do you want me to do? Just kick off? Just go ahead. You know, yeah, we know go ahead. it's going to be just a scratching the surface in half an hour, but yeah, you know, we want to get the interest peaks. I'm, I'm going to try to peak some interest here. So, yeah. tell me, um, what, what's my hard stop? Your hard yeah. stop is 30 minutes. No, what yeah. time is it? It's, it's 10 past five right now. Let's do, let's do 540? 540. 5.40. Yeah, 5.40. Okay. All right. Well, let's kick it off. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate what you guys are doing um, for sure. And I know it's, it's, it's not an easy thing. Um, this is Fayetteville. Has anybody ever been to Fayetteville? But no. hopefully sometime you will. Yeah. Yeah. This is um, the, one of the most famous landmarks in Arkansas. Um, it's Old Main. It was built in 1847. You can see we're in the foothills of the Ozark Mountains, the tallest um, point wow. um, between the Rockies and the Appalachians. So um, beautiful campus. Wow. And interesting story that this is north, this is south. Look at how this is taller. Do you know why it's taller? Let me give you a hint. It was built seven years after the Civil War. The North War. Oh. No wonder why no wonder why Luke Love there, you know, has an hour. My God. I tried to bring him to Miami. He said no, I will stay in Arkansas. He loved it. it it's Beautiful. a good place. Anyway, um, I'm gonna talk about surgically facilitated orthodox therapy, a, a term that we um, coined back in 2009, believe it or not, in an article where also coined um, alveoloskeletal that have really, both have really taken off. But I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of how we treat occlusal dilemmas. And basically, I'll let you know that I am absolutely airway focused, airway driven. Um, I can't compete necessarily with you, but I'm um, digitally focused as well. And, but let's kick it off. Let's look at a typical patient we treat. Uh, this is Lisa. Um, she wants a more beautiful smile. We got some pretty jacked up occlusion there. Do you agree? She's posterior vertical maxillary excess. And we have some issues. And so what we want to do is, is treat the real underlying problem. She also has fibromyalgia. She has chronic fatigue, uh, TMD symptoms. She gets up four or five times a night, can't sleep. Um, she's a classic case of upper airway resistance, and we feel a lot of this we can help. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that. But we have a specific, um, we always come up with three treatment plans, ideal or alternatives if we can, or, or if not, we don't compromise, we phase treatment. And we really look at, with these different options, what exactly is best um, to, 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 for the patient and what they're looking for, all right? And, and we try to satisfy as much as possible. We look at the airway, and she's a very constricted airway, and she's um, the high-res pulse oximetry, which really tells us a lot about what she's doing at night. You can see um, how she's getting fragmented sleep, which we feel is part of what's going on 
um, with the, with her overall health and and her TMD. Um, she came in for a more beautiful smile, but we want to deliver a total package. We want to increase not only the quality of her life through better aesthetics, but we want to improve the quantity of her life, if at all possible. And I think we in dentistry are in a very unique place to do that. And when you look at her, what do you you know? What are the only things in the right position in her face? Her centrals, right? Mm-hmm. Do, She's got beautiful teeth, they're in the wrong position. So can we, through an interdisciplinary approach, control and build everything around the centrals? Do we have that capacity? And can we treat the posterior vertical maxillary excess? Um, you know, these are the questions. I could easily slap braces on her, um, but I'd be concerned. Can we expand the upper arch? She's got a constricted arch. Does that relate to her airway issues and her TMD problems? And oh, by the way, um, she refuses to have braces. She wants us to do this, you know, with, with just normal treatment and, and with Invisalign. And so the problem is, is this is where she is right now. And where we want to go is here, intruding those posterior teeth, giving her the beautiful spark of smile. But if we're not careful, especially with SFOT, where we soften the resistance of the bone, it's a side product is to extrude the front teeth to correct the bite and turn it from a posterior VME into a full bore VME. So this is the challenge. And so looking at her, you know, what concerns she has, um, we're going to look at her, you know, she's got an increased lower face height and we do all our measurements and studies. And so we, we want to change her vertical. And so we're going to do corticotomies. We Invisalign, um, has, is very limited to what it can do to intrude teeth. It's very limited to what we can do to expand. We know that. And instead of looking at as an obstacle to treatment, what well, we look at it as an opportunity. Because I know if I can weaken the resistance in the bone, I can overcome those discrepancies, those inefficiencies with Invisalign. And so here's the grafting. And here's we're using anchorage and plates. We're going to intrude her whole posterior teeth. Treatment of choice for intrusion, especially in mass, is without a doubt clear aligners. Okay, and we go from here to there. What do you think? Wow, I felt like I'm say. Uh, look at the volume. Okay, all of a sudden, guess what? She's sleeping through the night. She's quitting taking some of her medication. She's working out again. Uh, you know, this is what I call quality of life changes, but look at the smile. Remember what I said? We want to control the only two things that are in the right spot, and that is our two front teeth. And look at how we intruded those posteriors. How long would you think this took? Hmm. I want to say, well, we only have a four to five month window, so I would have to be in that. How long normally does it take, Doc? Four months. Wow. And so I'm going to go through these cases quickly, but look at the difference in her face. Look how healthy, much healthier she looks. Improved the airway. Reduced her symptoms by over 45%. I mean, 75%. I told you how crazy it it was. And is it stable? 48 months later, look how solid that is. That is amazing. And we treat the soft and hard tissue. Look at, you can't see any recession. You can't, the, the tissue looks healthier than so it did before. The mini treating, implants go, I'm sorry, like the mini implants go at the same time as the corticotomy surgery. Yes. Uh-huh. Correct. So, you know, this is a very typical case that we see every day in our practice now. And we're, all the, the functional parameters that we were taught, all the aesthetic parameters, and what I want to say is she now is a different person. She's healthier. She's, you know, she's off the medications. I think we improve the quality and quantity of her life. And what I want to ask the group is who else in healthcare can treat major underlying health issues and make our patients more beautiful at the same time, except for us. We're the only ones and we need to celebrate it and we really need to get fired up. But there's all kinds of ways that we can help, and you know, typically in an all-day lecture, I'm gonna go through all these different things. 
but basically, you know, it's all about the interdisciplinary approach. And, you know, the, we started out with multidisciplinary, then about the mid um, 1980s, early interdisciplinary. This is when I wrote my textbook and I actually differentiated inter from multi. Multi is working with different disciplines, but with, as separate entities. Inter means working between. And so that's where we're going now. And the, the new interdisciplinary teams, we mature. And you know, the, the more mature interdisciplinary team, we end up knowing more about each other. We think alike, our areas overlap. We have common values and goals. We have seamless collaboration through cloud-based digital um, patient-centric records. Um, hopefully we're considering airway and we welcome digital technology. In the future, is the same, except we need to be airway focused and really make a change in these patients' life because airway positive is beautiful. We call it a dental facelift. And we maximize digital technology, which certainly you guys know how to do down there in beautiful Miami, okay? And we look a lot at what we call the fundamental components, all right? And we call alveoloskeletal, the relationship of this, the dental alveolar complex on the skeletal base. It's a very complex issue that we did not have good treatment for before. Um, and so I break malocclusions down into these three fundamental components, obviously skeletal, dental alveolar has to do with the relationship of the teeth in the dental alveolar complex, and the, and the dent alveoloskeletal is a dental alveolar complex on the skeletal base. And these are the tools we have to work with. And um, depending on which fundamental components are a problem. And we're changing now, we're getting really good at treating these jacked up adults, but our focus is really shifting a lot to prevent these problems from happening. And we can definitely do that. And we do that through anthropologically driven function, structure, and behavior, because most of these issues are modern man problems. Why do we have malocclusions, oops, why do we have malocclusions like this? And we go back to our ancestors, um, we know now that, you know, basically almost 70% of us have a, a significant malocclusion that can use treatment. What about our hunter-gatherer ancestors? And I actually wrote a, an article on this with, with Dr. Jerome Rose, a dental anthropologist, and he'll tell you 5%. Class threes and class twos really didn't exist. And rarely would he find it up to 10% of a population, except when a population was in trouble from disease or malnutrition. That's the only time in our ancestors we find the type of malocclusions that we have. And so uh, this is very interesting. This is Dr. Rose. And you know he goes to, to Egypt and digs up these, they actually, in the desert, dig up um, <clears throat> skeletons. And they, what they do is they scrape off the outer layer and they dig down and they, uh, because they have a darkness here, they know somebody's um, dug down into the different layers. And this is what they find. But what I wanna show you is this. This is what these skulls look like. Wow. Look at the robust nature of those dental alveolar complexes, okay? And why are we so different? And when I said that only 5% of them had a malocclusion compared to us, dental anthropologists include third molars. And if we did that with our population, just think how bad a shape we would be in. And so comparative wise, everything small, they had a much, much more robust dental alveolar complex, okay? Well, let's treat some cases. What about Charity? 31, you can see very constricted upper arch. A look at her masseters. Can you see she has a very traumatic occlusion and she has um, really hypertrophy masseters. She's not sleeping well. Very difficult situation. You know, we feel that she too is not only has her mandible trapped with her pandals down and back, but she's clenching and she's working out all night and she appears to have pretty significant upper airway resistance type problems. How can we treat this? Oh yeah, she refuses to have braces. Can we treat this patient? How can we treat her? And so here she is nine months later with Invisalign. 
and corticotomies. And here's the implants in and restored provisionally wise. And look at the difference in her face and her smile. And when we look, compare her, I'm just comparing her eyes here. Notice how much um, narrower her, her face is because of her masseters. And again, we talk about occlusal disorders and problems. Um, I think this is a classic example. And um, we can actually, she'll actually tell us here in a minute. Hopefully we'll be able to hear. Come on. For some reason my computer's locked. Oh, there she is. Let me go ahead and start this over real quick because I think it's real important. Can you hear that? Mm, not really. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's too bad. Go ahead and go on. But what she's saying about how she's sleeping through the night and how she has more confidence. And again, treating major underlying health issues and making people. I don't have that question in my face. I think my computer's worn out from from doing this for <laughs> hey hour. That's a marathon. <laughs> Another case. I'm going to really blow through a few cases here, guys. That's, um, that's good. Beautiful young lady. You know, unattractive smile. Her teeth are flared out. Gosh darn this. I need to restart my computer. I'm sorry. Go okay. for it. If you have to, go ahead. You feel no, that you need it. Okay. Well, let's just let's just see because I'd have to re re come in. But look at her profile and the flatness of her upper lip. You know the tendency would be to want to take her lower front teeth back. That we can see from her um, lateral step how her teeth are flared out, and there's mm -hmm. no bone on the facial. See how they're flared out? Somebody put her in some magic brackets that could fix her problem and make her more beautiful. But they neglected the principles of really up optimal tooth movement. Now, in a beautiful young lady like this, how do you treat her? Are you going to take out lower teeth or reproximate and drag the lowers back to drop yeah. that flattening or lip support? You know, I don't want to do that, but can we bring her upper forward? Um, is it going to require orthodontic surgery for that? And so what we're going to do is we're going to treat her again with Invisalign, all right, and clear aligners. And just, just doing upper corticotomies, not doing lower corticotomies. And look at how we're able to build bone in this area. Look at how much fuller she is now compared to where she was and changing the, the angulation of those teeth. Look at how we develop the, the upper arch. So we're changing that infrastructure, changing the relationship of the dental alveolar complex on the skeletal base. And here she is, her smile. And again, this is only four months worth of treatment. And look at the change already. And what's it do to her face? We take a, a pretty young lady and make her drop dead gorgeous. Instead of retracting and flattening those beautiful full lips, we nice. basically augmented wow. the upper. And so what we're doing is we find the problem where it lies, and we have the tools to treat those problems. What about this case? She comes in, um, doesn't like her, her smile, her teeth. She's already had treatment once. You can see how dished in she is, very constricted. She's, um, you know, she looks like she's about 45 or so. She's actually only 30. Look at the pursing of her lips. And I told her what we needed. This was 15 years ago. No, it was more like 20 years ago now. And I said, what we need to do is a uh, double jaw surgery with a multiple piece maxilla to advance everything forward, the uh, Bill Arnett type of treatment, and cut back her chin and cut back her anterior nasal spine because everything is um, dished in. This is a perfect example of somebody 
with dental alveolar retrusion. This, the dental alveolar complex is too far posterior on the skeletal face. And look how constricted her anterior arches are, the extrusion. She's missing teeth, the teeth were dumped in. Upper bicuspid extraction? Yep, and lower. Okay. And, and so the last thing we want to do is put braces on and try to expand, right? So how are you going to treat this case with that much overbite? And by the way, she refuses to wear braces, okay? Oh. And so she came back um, now, um, and now she's 45 with, with three kids, and now she heard we had, we're doing something different. So we're going to go ahead and treat these problems um, and do optimal space appropriation. And... We're going to use digital technology with, with Nemo Tech and plan our case so she can, we can educate her. She, you know, when we tell her we're going to do corticotomies to treat the bone and develop more structure and move her teeth forward, she goes, what's that going to look like? What's it going to do? What can I expect? And so the digital technology is really amazing what we can do to plan and then reverse treatment plan. All right. And so here are the corticotomies. Typically when we're gaining arch length, we only do the, um, the buckle, but since I'm trying to open spaces, we're gonna do buckle and lingual to create the wrap effect. And you can see the deep cuts, the bone grafting. And here she is six months later. And you can see how we've opened up spaces on it. We not only open sites on the lower, we opened up spaces on the upper. We don't have enough room for implants, so we're gonna to have to be creative. And this is where the interdisciplinary approach goes to an entirely new level of the collaboration, because I wanna deliver um, when the restorative is done that we can do as minimally invasive restorations as absolutely possible. She has very unesthetic um, central incisors, but she's got beautiful enamel. And so I'm just gonna enamel plasti those and reshape those and also help close that black triangle. Now here she is at six months post-op after um, um, one refinement. You can see how we're starting to space thing. And this is where the restorative dentist basically takes over and tells me where to position the teeth for them to do the best restorations. So look how far forward we move those lower incisors. And we not only didn't retract, we opened spaces. And we're doing studies on this now. And we were actually able to increase our inner canine width 8.4 millimeters. Wow. That's brutal. Now we're doing enamel plasty. And you can start seeing how we're filling out those lip supports, giving our dental facelift. Here she is at 12 months now. She has the implants in the lower. And now we're finishing up with the upper. And what we're gonna end up doing, and look how robust her smile's turning out to be. And again, the fullness of the smile. And this is kind of the stages we go through, the initial treatment plan, which the entire team gets together and determines how much space we think we can gain and where it um, needs to be, but the, then, me as the orthodontist determines where to put the space for the best orthodontic mechanics with the clear aligners. We want it further forward so we have the posterior anchorage and we don't want to try to expand second molars. Those are our posterior anchorage. We're going to expand the rest of the arch. And so we open spaces and then at this point the restorative dentist takes over and tells me where to ideally put the teeth for their best restorations. Notice what he did. Um, he actually, at this point, did some post, some distal um, porcelain Pauses. veneers on the right. canine. Those are uh, veneers. Veneer. Just on the distal. Right. Yeah. And you can see the type of restorations, enamel plasty in the upper. Um, and then we have conservative um, onlay veneers. And then um, some onlay, some posterior. We ate up those spaces. On the lower, it's easy. We just did um, some all, um, rest, all, all um, ceramic restorations and some implants. And then we have to build in the occlusion in the face and build it to her particular smile. So you can see 
how we tuck these spaces. And the last thing we want to do, believe it or not, we do not want to drag molars forward to close space. Because if we did, the perioral tissues with a force on them will actually cause in mass relapse anterior posterior. So we need to keep the posterior that's a great point. in their position. Not, Doc, so in this, I'm sorry, in this case, I saw we had a very deep curve of SP in the lowers. Um, and I see that the plane got very nicely leveled. Did you do it by verticalizing the posteriors or, or intruding the anteriors? Now, what we did is we got what's called relative intrusion as I opposed see. to absolute relative because as we, those teeth were like this, and as we move those forward six millimeters, okay, notice what happens. So yeah. as a, so we really didn't intrude the root. We just changed it through the relatively wise, okay? I got you. Um, wow. But you're exactly right. So it's a, they're at a different level. But everything's to fit the smile. Look at her arc of smile. Look how full her buccal quarters are. In the superimposition, um, you can see what we're able to, to accomplish. Wow, to that's dramatic. Relationship. And you can't see it, but she definitely has bone there. We changed the alveoloskeletal relationship. And you can see the amount of tooth movement. Now, the uppers actually did come back a little bit, even though we opened up spaces. That's why when we're changing, when you're increasing width, you have to open space or you'll accidentally retract the interiors because there's only so much tooth structure, okay? I also, look at this, cheated by controlling the vertical and intruded some, and I can do that with corticotomies and uh, occlusal bite blocks with the, the clear aligners. And here you can see her profile changes, fullness of her lip support, and you won't be able to hear this probably, but you'll just see the way she talks now. I'm asking her if she would do it again. <laughs> There's no question. No, the base of the nose changed too. Oh yeah. my God. Look at that smile, Big guys. Big time. Wow. What totally. do you think? Yes. Wow. The leap. Would never, never imagine this would be. Everything, the leap, everything looks. With aligners. Yep. Now, I'm going to show you another patient, and she's actually from um, Boca down there, Boca Raton. And she came to me, I think I was her thir lucky 13th um, uh, second opinion, okay? Oh, wow. Here she is, she's a beautiful um, ballerina. And um, you can see she too has a very flat smile line. And um, parents aren't happy to say the least. She's already been through a couple years worth of treatment. And this is where she started, you know, a very straightforward case. The dentist, the orthodontist wanted to take out premolars and the mother refused. And so the, the orthodontist put on some magic brackets that grows bone, okay? And this is what she looks like, all right? Now, I want you to look really closely because um, everything looks like the teeth are slightly flared, but really they're not slightly flared, they're severely oh flared. Severely flared. Severely. And what do you think? Wow. Wow. Yeah. There is no palatal bone. Where is oh, that? Yeah. So I'm going to refer her to you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you good with that? My God. <laughs> Thank God I know how we're going to end up already because I was <laughs> talking the first time. Honestly, you want to know something, Doc? I, yeah. I, somebody else forwarded their x-rays to me. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, the buck's got to stop somewhere, right? Yes. But this is no, how you because I saw this in January, Hamid, and I record and I send it to you. That's why you no, see no, the no, case no, as no, well. No, 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 no. Actually, Sam, Sam saw this patient. Okay. I'm talking about two years ago, and uh, he sent me her x-rays, and... And I, you know, they were asking if they should do bicuspid extraction. And I said, listen, this is a very tough case, but I would not. Um, I, and I lost, you know, I never knew what they did with it. But now it's phenomenal that I, I see it now. So show me, Doc, what did you do? 
Okay, well, first of all, it was fun listening to all the different um, recommendations from extracting premolars. I don't know if that, how that really helped us too much to orthodontic surgery, to extracting the teeth and grafting and planning for future implants. And you have a world-class ballerina here, but look at these teeth. You can see the roots right out of bone. And wow. this is where um, we, you know, we can use digital technology, but look at not only the anterior teeth, but the posterior teeth. This is just uncontrolled tipping. And it just tipped those teeth right. I'm amazed that they're still vital. And she's religiously wearing a retainer so it doesn't get in the way. Hey, Mariana. <laughs> um, and so this is where we're trying to see what's possible, looking at space appropriation. And um, so we want to create, um, we want to try to get those teeth back in bone. And so what we're going to do is first we got to create more volume. And this is why taking out upper premolars and trying to tip the tooth in might give us in the back of the right thing. But the problem is, and you guys are listening to the world expert um, after me on this, is we, we have a, a severely constricted maxilla that somebody tried to treat with dental velar therapy and it doesn't work, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do, oops, we're gonna do an MSE and create more bony structure, you know, get more of a Laporte three type expansion and to give us more bone that we can then correct that tipping of the posterior teeth. It was really important for her not to wear um, braces. Mm -hmm. And I inst instructed her not to wear any kind of retainer. She was worried about her teeth falling out at this time. And so I said, wow. do not, whatever you do, hold those teeth in place because the body will want those teeth to be in a better position if it can. So we expanded. We used MSE because we did not want to have any chance of moving the molars further buckle. We wanted to move the maxilla expanded laterally. And then we're going to do, with, now we're going to do SFOT with Invisalign. And the reason we want to do that is because I want to build bone on the facial. Um, we don't want to retract. We have a beautiful young lady. We don't, do not want to flatten her, her lips. And so this is where we look at things radically different. If we're deficient in an area, we see what we can do um, to correct it. So she needed a combination of skeletal type treatment with the MSE, and now we're gonna treat more of an alveoloskeletal change working with, with her. And you know, there's a big question, can we grow bone? And this is a patient that we treated, and I'll finish up real quick. Um, you can see the dehiscences here. We actually did SFOT, and look how much we expanded her upper arch. Tremendously expanded. And then we went back in for a second surgery because we wanted to extrude all the teeth. And this is what she looked like when we went back in. Look at the robust wow. bone she has wow. now. And what you have to realize is those teeth are two and a half millimeters more facial. And we grew that kind of bone. And so these are the corticotomies. Uh, we're going to loosen the bone. We're going to try to do labial root torque. And we go from here to here. And this is only two months in the treatment. And we go, and, and now last time I saw her, she went from there to there. Wow. And we have bone. And we have bone. Oh my and God. And the bone will become more and more mature as this patient. Um, this is a different patient. It looks like she doesn't have bone, but look what happens 18 months later. And there she is. We're working on her smile. We're going to do another round and try to gently extrude her anterior teeth to give her more incisor exposure. And wow. she's cute as she could be, and she's becoming more and more beautiful. And we didn't retract that beautiful lips, those beautiful lips that she has. Thank and God. so, you know, there's a lot of different things we can do. All the red is, is, is um, digital technology that we know and love. And you know, we talked about the interdisciplinary approach and all the different things that we can do and what it's going in the future, being more airway focused, maximizing digital technology. But yeah, 
the bottom line is the future is now. And we in dentistry are absolutely leading the way. And with that, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to share. Thank you. Oh thank my you. God, that's what it was like. Beautiful. Wow. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I, it's like I told you guys, I told it's you. Crazy. I, this has been good. Imagine that I've been having all this for this long by myself, and now we're able to share. <laughs> you, just, you, just wait, you just wait till you see Mariana's stuff. It's, it's amazing. My oh, God. Yes, I see up. it too. It's going to be. So we have another winner. You almost done. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for Thank the heart, brother. Uh -huh. I really appreciate everybody that supports this project. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now sure. we have a new participant. Thank you, Doc. I'm going to put Thank at you. least the pink, you know, because